Welcome back to Live Without Littlewood. Without Littlewood, yes, it's me, Master Dirk, doing a pale imitation of Mark Littlewood, um, who is busy doing Tai Chi on a beach or whatever it is people do on sabbaticals these days. And, ooh, I wish I had a boring programme for you tonight, full of little inconsequential things like how bad the pavements are and whether girls have winkies. But no, we have enormous, big, interesting topics to talk about that go to the very heart of what sort of society we live in and want to live in. And we're going to start, I'm sorry to depress you, with Boris Johnson. What about this relaunch? Is it any good? What's he relaunching? What is, does even he know what the relaunch is? Second up, who runs Britain? Is it Treasury civil servants? Is it the trade unions? There's talk now of a general strike again. Is it Greenpeace? I'm starting to wonder whether Boris Johnson isn't really Caroline Lucas in a fat suit. Third up, we're talking about the NHS. Will it kill us or can we kill it? It's time we made cuts, but can we? What sort of cuts? Now, I know what you're thinking. That sounds a bit heavy going and dreary, and it's not going to be much fun. But it is going to be a lot of fun, because I'm joined by four of the most spectacularly witty, humorous, fun guests I could possibly be joined by. And they are... <laughs> Okay, you already know because the graphics gave it away, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Well, I'm going to be joined by the wonderful Christian Nemitz, Head of Political Economy at the IEA, to talk about why we've not managed to privatise the NHS yet. Naughty boy that he is. Uh, the very influential blogger and columnist Tim Montgomery, uh, to discuss the big dog Boris relaunch. Sounds slightly rude. Um, and Danny Boxhall, who was at Unheard, now fighting for the oppressed at the Taxpayers' Alliance, to tell us why the Treasury is blocking tax cuts. But first, a clever, thoughtful Member of Parliament, he's got an MBA from Columbia, chap, bright chap, he used to be the Lord Commissioner of the Treasury, which sounds like something out of Alice in Wonderland, but apparently that is a proper job. <laughs> um, um, and until last week, he was the government's anti-corruption champion. Please welcome MP for sunny Western Supermare, John Penrose. Hi, John. So you're no longer anti-corruption champion, which is great. Now you can be corrupt and not worry about it. Well, it, 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 I, you know, my, my cup overflows. What I've discovered is that uh, apparently I, I thought I was going to have loads more time, but, but apparently not. So, oh, that yeah. happens. That happens. Sorry. It's funny how it fills up. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you quit the job. Was that vaguely, in some way, directly, indirectly to do with Boris Johnson? I, I'm afraid it was. I mean, I, I, it's all over the, the, the web, so I, I won't sort of you know, bore your... your uh, your, your viewers with it in, in detail now, but the problem with it is that uh, the Sue Gray report basically um, said you know, that the, the, he wasn't at quite as many parties as everyone thought, but there were major um, failings of leadership, um, and she laid them fairly and squarely at his door um, and probably at Simon Case's too, um, but certainly at his door, um, and leadership is one of the seven Nolan principles of integrity in public life. Um, fail to live up to them and you are failing to adhere to the ministerial code, failing to adhere to the ministerial code, this is supposed to be a resigning matter. And, and since he wouldn't, I did. OK, so uh, 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 you've gone, he hasn't. That doesn't seem quite right, but nevertheless. Um, and then he got a good kicking in those elections. And so he's had a reset, a, a, a refocus, a relaunch, a fresh start. And this, I understand, from my excellent IEA notes, is the sixth time he's had a relaunch and reset. And there are the dates here of the various ones. Um, I'm not sure any, anything much changes. What's, when, when politicians say we're going to refocus... I mean, it feels like they've hit their head and they're going, does that really mean anything? Well, I, I really hope it does, is the simple answer, because um, you know, we've, we've got a really important programme. We're now out of the pandemic. Um, we've still got a sort of post-Brexit programme that's got to happen. And the trouble with it is that you know, levelling up is great because it's actually really popular. The ideas behind it, the principles behind it, they still move people's opinions, they still enthuse people. Um, but we've only got half a parliament to do it in, not, not because of anything that... You know, Boris did, it's because of the pandemic. So he's got half the amount of time to do just as much as he originally planned, and he's got to get a shift on. So I hope that the reset worked, because he, he needs to use this to, to press on the accelerator. And if he doesn't, then, you know, then, the, then everyone's going to start tapping their fingers again. OK, we need to reset. 
Um, and he said lovely things in the speech. He said, um, sometimes the best way the government can help is simply to get out of the way. I'm sure that went down well with yeah. a lot of MPs. Went down um, well with me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he says that, you know, we must refute the idea that the answer to every problem is more state spending. I mean, that sounds, you know, hunky-dory. Yep. But as Alistair Heath writes in The Telegraph, a real reset would require a comprehensive shift on tax, spend, the economy, housing, energy, levelling up on the environment. And he, certainly Heath, and a lot of people don't think that's going to happen. Well, so, so I think, actually, if, if there's a reset to say we've got the ideas in levelling up, um, they don't have to be all about state spending and, and more, more government. They can be about opportunity and choice and all those good... Uh, good conservative principles as well, and actually there may be better ways of delivering on them, um, then I think he can probably, in the famous Boris phrase, he can have his cake and eat it at the same time. But he hasn't got long to do it. He's got to show that that's what the new approach is. Um, and, you know, I, I, I hope he does, because the, the clock is ticking. Yeah, he's going to have to show that in order to sort of quieten down the 148 who voted against it. I mean, I, I, I take that on board. I come from the North East. I'm very keen on levelling up. Yeah. Lower taxes, you know, um, 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 slashing taxes in certain areas. In fact, it would be lovely to have it across the board. If it works in the North East and elsewhere, why not in the country as, it, uh, as a whole? But when it comes to slashing taxes, people close to Boris Johnson last week are reported as saying, we haven't got the money yeah. to cut taxes. What a strange sentence. I mean, that's quite a revealing way of it. We haven't got the money to cut taxes. That suggests that actually a, cat, a tax cut is money that they're giving us. Yeah. So, so th this is where there are two competing parts of, you know, warring parts of any Tory soul, aren't there? One is this urge to you know, cut taxes, as you've rightly pointed out, um, but we are also the party of sound money. Um, and what we can't do is just fund tax cuts through borrowing, because that just passes the problem on to, to our you know, future generations. Um, and it's also got to be the case that if we do cut taxes, um, or whatever we do, it's got to drive growth, because otherwise, you know, otherwise you're just fueling inflation. So there's a, it is, it is, you know, it's, it's the holy grail, but I do, I do get that you can't just do it in one way in a way which just runs up the national debt. You need to cut spending too. You need to cut spending. You can't cut taxes if you don't cut spending. Yeah, That's right. what you're saying, isn't yeah. it? Yes, but, but we still have HS2. We're still yeah, getting money to Covent Garden Opera House. We're still, he doesn't want to do that. And, and, and bear in mind as well that culturally, we've all, and myself and even, even the IEA, guardians of free market that it, that they, that it is, it, we've all got a bit used, frankly, to over during the course of the pandemic to the government riding to the rescue. That's what, that's what you know, things like furlough were. Um, and while they were really you know, necessary in the short term, we've got to sort of reset our, our horizons about what the government and the state should be doing. And that's, that's easy to say, really hard to do, because we've all got a bit used to it. We've got a bit used to very, very, very large amounts of public spending. Yeah, we have, as a country. Yeah, it's difficult. So who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Is Boris Johnson the, going well, to so, do it? So I, it, interestingly, um, I, I think part of our problem is that we're doing some of it now, and then we go and do other things that don't match. So for example, here we are talking about privatising Channel 4, um, but we're also talking about a massive increase in central planning for the railways. It's not quite renationalisation, but it's pretty close. So there's a whole series of things where we're sort of doing, we're heading in one direction one day and then in a different direction the, the next. I think that there's, a, there's plenty of opportunity to do, to do things which are creating opportunity, creating growth, creating choice, empowering consumers, creating big citizens and small government, all those good things. Um, but which, uh, but but we just need to make sure that we aren't mixing our messages. Okay. Well, now I'm going to bring in uh, 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 the beautiful and gorgeous founder of Conservative Home, the wonderful Tim Montgomery, to help us. <laughs> Good. Tim, how are you doing? Good. So, Tim, uh, you tweeted I noticed last week um, or this week that um, since. Boris has had that kicking in the uh, 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 from his MPs. Yeah. You could not think of a well. You'll probably remember your own tweet. A single thing, a single thing mm. he has done to address their concerns. Tell us about that. Well, John can put me right if I've um, if he's identified things. But the extraordinary thing was, I was in a sweepstake. I don't know whether you took part in any sweepstakes. We were all sort of various groups of people were guessing how many Tory MPs would vote against Boris and I was, I can't remember my precise number, but I was 120 something and I thought that was pretty, if over 100 MPs voted against him, I thought that was pretty significant. 
If 120 yards, I thought his leadership would be in difficulty. When 148, which is a similar sort of order of the number of people that basically, proportion that killed off Mrs Thatcher when she was Prime Minister, I thought that was a big deal rebellion. And my own view is perhaps a more honourable Prime Minister would, in response to that, perhaps have resigned because they'd really had lost the confidence of the party. Um, but at least what you would do is you wouldn't go on national television and say, what a brilliant, mar what a marvellous result, and carry on as if nothing had happened. I didn't know you did impressions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that is really what he, he did. And, OK, that was the night, and, you know, he was probably just relieved to have won, because I understand earlier on in that evening, his whips had warned him, this is going to be quite a lot closer than we thought. And there are reasons for that. You may want to come back to me on. But um, that not to have really seen any sort of, we understand that you really are unhappy with me. We're going to think and address this. And, you know, the relaunch speech, which was that ridiculous revisiting of housing policies that we've had regurgitated previously a number of times, just sort of said to me, adding insult to injury, really, the, the government wasn't, ta or the Prime Minister wasn't taking uh, the rebellion by, John was, I thought, were really principled, rebel you know, stable. You did keep me waiting on BBC, I was about to do BBC, and I had Delight. to wait half an uh, hour because your resignation <laughs> at the same time. But, um, so the response I, it just to hasn't the responded who, to people like that. So this, the, he hasn't responded to the people, the, the critics. I noticed in Prime Minister's question time today, yeah, the, um, uh, Keir Starmer was saying, you know, 15 tax rises, you've done 15, throttling growth. Um, and he says, when, when did screwing business turn into an economic policy? This is the Labour Party. Exactly. This is the Labour yeah. Party attacking the Tory party, complaining about 15 tax rises, throttling gro growth. Yeah. The CBI is saying action stations to kickstart the economy. It seems it's so, and yet, oh, I remember reading in the Telegraph last week, you're saying Boris Johnson says farmers must grow more fruit and veg. <laughs> I mean, the scale of the problem and the scale of the response, John. So the, there's, there's nuggets of gold um, which, which are already there. So, for example, this is just before the vote of no confidence, but um, Rishi Sunak, for example, has already announced he's going to be raising the national insurance um, contributions threshold and he's going to be um, re reducing the, the, the taper rate for, for universal credit, all of which will help the lowest paid. Really big, really big and important intervention at a time when you know, when household bills are a nightmare, um, and it's a proper conservative intervention. It's making sure that people keep more of the money that they've earned. It's great. So there's there's nuggets of gold in there, and then we get this, and then we get all this other stuff too. And if it was purely the nuggets of gold, it would be awesome. I mean, there's an awful lot to to applaud. But then you get some of this other stuff too. So that, that's my point but about even, consistency. Even that, though, is, it, it's exactly the consistency. It's the, it's the seesawing. Yeah. And um, I think Rishi Sunak, as much as Boris Johnson, needs to take responsibility for this. You know, one time they put up national insurance. This is the big thing. We're mm -hmm. going to protect the National Health Service. And then they're promising, uh, basically, a cut in income tax before the next election, which almost just completely reverses the national insurance rise, and they seesaw from one thing to another, from one spring statement to one budget. What's the overall plan? What the I cost really of living, the crisis, so they're going to give us some money, but obviously that's got to be paid out of taxation, which, yeah. they, can't rise, which they can't reduce because uh, we can't afford it. I mean, the Treasury says, I mean, there was another quote from the Treasury, tax cuts would add to inflation. I mean, either people at the Treasury do not understand economics or they're trying to hoodwink us and think we're stupid, but why is it that when we spend our own money, it's inflationary, but when the government spends our money, it's not inflationary? Um, <laughs> I'd give that one to you, John, because <laughs> yeah, I would say, uh, you obviously, you aren't, you were it, talking. It, 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 de it depends on the kind of ta ta tax cut, doesn't it? Yeah, so, so some... No, it so doesn't. No, 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 no don't, 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 come on, John. Come, so, so you're, being, you're trying to be good after no. being naughty last week, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well, we'll come back to that. Um, but but so, so, for example, if... It, g give you an example. So um, if, you, if you've got tax cuts that promote business investment, then that will, that will drive growth much more effectively than something just drives up consumption. Uh, yeah, any economist will say that to you. So, so, so th it does matter the kind of tax cut but the um, government just is spending, to make sure we're doing it right. But the, spending, the, uh, the government is spending money that drives up consumption. 
It employs people on HS2. They go out and they buy curry and they buy beer. It, empl it employs social workers. They go out and they have haircuts and they buy beer, whatever you do. I mean, they, that just doesn't wash, John. But anyway, listen, let's not get into the, uh, the, 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 the finery yeah. of that. The point is you say nuggets of gold. They're little things nuggets, aren't they? That's the trouble. They're niggets, little things. Mm -hmm. And also enormously contradictory, as you say. Everything they do seems to... It well, seems immensely contradictory. You know, we've got a terrible problem. Every time you go and fill up your car, it's every hundred quid, half of it is tax. They've been absolutely pummeling traditional mm. sources of energy for ages under the green agenda. Um, and now, oh, uh, you know, this, he hasn't put that back in the box, has he? We've still got the net zero, we've still got decarbonisation. But to help us with the money the, to pay for all this nonsense, more tax, mm. more money uh, from the government. It, just, it, not, it doesn't seem to add up. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing I would love to see is, is massive tax simplification. So you could, for example, we've just introduced a, uh, a statement calling for a, a carbon borrowed adjustment, which would basically level the playing field for British manufacturing. So it would get rid of some of the disadvantage which British manufacturing has had from high energy prices. Um, but if you do introduce a carbon border adjustment, you should then be able to fund getting rid of fuel, all of fuel duty, not just a bit. For example, you can get rid of a whole series of green levies, just wipe them all out in one go, um, and you have simpler, lower taxes as a result, and you get a level playing field for British manufacturing and exports. So that's the sort of thing which I think could make a huge difference, um, and would also make life an awful lot more um, you know, affordable on our energy bills at the same time. Um, we're going to have an inflation czar, I read. We? Well, that was the Bank of England governor, or is it we've decided no, to replace someone, him. Someone, <laughs> Although he's, he's not been very good at that he's, job. He's but, an uh, inflation wussy. This is, <laughs> this, is, this is an inflation czar, um, apparently. I mean, they, they print half a trillion pounds worth of money, uh, prices go up, and then we, we have an inflation czar who apparently is going to go around and ask firms not to raise prices. I mean, this it sounds like the 1970s. Oh, 1970s. Diocletian tried that. Diocletian <laughs> said that if you raise prices, we'll kill you. And um, oddly enough, people still raised prices. Who's going to be the czar? Oh, is, oh, this is the Just Eat man who also attacked the Tories for being basically nasty. I I don't uh, know, but what I don't know, can we say bastards on Life of Little Words? Or I just, know, but what, I just thankless, <laughs> but what a thankless task. But yeah. also it imagines that companies are raising taxes on a whim just because they fancy doing it. They don't mm. seem to realise that companies mm. with a very heavy heart raise taxes, and mm. they do so because their costs are rising, and if they don't, they're going to lose money. I mean, I mean, it just seems that, John, is this a Tory government? Is this a Tory government? Uh, it, well, y yes, it is, but the, but the point about it is we've just, I, I think we're all in agreement, is we need some consistency. We, need a, we, we, we keep on sort of doing one thing and then, and then opposing it in a different way. There's, we, we want our nuggets of gold to be a There's solid There's another seed, way of saying we? consistency. I expect we yeah. look, um, I think we are, the three of us on this uh, little stage are old enough to remember 1987. Before uh, 2019, 1987 was the last time the Tories won a big majority. Big majorities where you can really do things come around once in a generation. And the, 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 the judgment I have, the, work, the biggest judgment I have on this government is not that Boris Johnson is perhaps unpopular. Fortunately, he's up against Keir Starmer. We could still win the next election. Yeah. Keir Starmer is no Tony Blair. Mm -hmm. um, yes, he's made ethical mistakes, serious ethical mistakes during Partygate. But the biggest indictment is when you win a majority of 80, if Margaret Thatcher, almost any Conservative leader, one of them, were, that would be the beginning. Yeah. What do we want to do? We've now got an opportunity to really tackle some of the fundamental problems in the yeah. country. Actually, what Boris, how Boris Johnson reacted to that was, great, cruise for a few years. I've achieved stuff. And it's the, well, he has. Yeah, yeah, he has. The, the, Even the, in the, there's been a pandemic. Yeah. Do you know in the World War II, mm -hmm. Beveridge came up with his, you know, he plan for the, yeah, world, for the world. Yeah. This pandemic is, is used by an excuse for this government for doing nothing. Mm -hmm. You can actually chew gum and walk at the same time if you're a, a proper politician. Mm -hmm. You really are being too generous, I'm John. John. You're being really well, well behaved. This is the it's, man, remember, the, I mean, he boasted the, about being Hesse. Yeah, he was the Brexit Hesse. He pro yeah, boasted yeah. about being yeah. Hesse time. Yeah. He boasted about ending austerity. Yeah. And he's gone, I mean, he boasts about intervention. He did it when he was mayor of London. We had a piano on every corner. Yeah. You know, we had wobbly bridges, the, you know, whatever the what, whatever hell. And now, Grow for Britain, the first food strategy for 75 years. We had a food strategy 75 years ago because there was a war. I mean, you know, he boasts about the fact that he's now going to be micromanaging food. Ian Botham had an article saying, you know, if you're in the countryside and you want to have a pond, 
you need to apply to the government. You need a DEFRA to give you. So yeah. you can't spit in the countryside without DEFRA's approval. I mean, you know, what, what, what we're supposed so to have I, left Brexit for well, deregulation. So I'm, 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 I am one of the, the biggest fans of what I hope will be an important bill, which is Jacob Rees-Mogg's Brexit benefits. It's the, it's the better regulation, the, the, the getting rid of red tape bill. Um, that's due very shortly. Um, I've been talking to, to Jacob about it quite a lot. Um, D Jacob has kind of got religion about this. Um, and I'm really hoping that when, when it gets published, it will be as strong as, as it needs to be because it's, it's potentially one of the most important things. It could solve some of the examples you just talked about, um, but it's got to do it in the way which just you know, doesn't, doesn't dilute you know, the standard of your food yeah. or anything like that, but does just gets rid of the, makes us much more light on our feet. And and I, I think that's a huge job because a lot of your questions are focused on tax and I understand that. But as you look at what Trump did most effectively, actually it was massive deregulation yeah. of lots of economic sectors. And they're harder and less easy to understand, but he and really. Is that Boris Johnson? Is that Boris? No, but I'm just saying. But if we get Rees Mogg, wait and see. You know. Sorry, good, sorry. It just, I just think that if we're going to look at what might be possible, mm. I think I think deregulation of the kind John has just described yeah. may be the thing that happens because there's less political resistance to it as well. The, I think the, not no political resistance, but less political resistance. Well, and, and it has the advantage that it doesn't cost the treasury yeah. a bean. Yeah. Well, so, listen, listening, it's lovely having you, John, because actually, suddenly I feel I'm, it's all going to be all right. Right. I'm a glass <laughs> half full <laughs> sort of thing. So we need a good sound dose of apocalypse. And for that, <laughs> I'm going to welcome head of, um, uh, um, uh, 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 what's it, Chops? Political economy at the IEA, <laughs> <laughs> Christian Lewis. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> missing even shaking hands. Yeah. Right. And now, my second topic is who really runs Britain? So by the way, the BBC would really disapprove of this panel. Four white men on uh, <laughs> so we are in trouble. You know, we no, were, it's it's equality, equality commission. We've got, we've got, we've got a woman coming up the rear. As a <laughs> <girl>. um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that just was A, it doesn't work as a Duke Blanc um, uh, and, and A, although I think it's on PC to call Move on, move on, on yeah, I think we move on at that point, yeah. <laughs> Swiftly. Who's running Britain? That's the next topic on my card. <laughs> not, uh, not you after that, not you. <laughs> <laughs> the largest railway strike since 19... Oh, I can't focus, I need to refocus on <laughs> Boris Johnson. 1989, is it the unions? Is there a problem? What's, what's happening here, Christian? I think generally activist groups uh, have taken over. If you look at things like the, the net zero agenda, that suddenly came out of nowhere. Of course, we had green policies long before, um, going back until the late 80s. That's not new. But uh, suddenly there were these groups like Extinction Rebellion, uh, the Greater Thunberg Movement, um, ramping up the rhetoric about how this is going to be the apocalypse, the end of the world, un unless we do something totally drastic. And the government immediately caved in, declared a climate emergency, the net zero goal. And suddenly, even though there were no new predictions, no new climate models, it's not that any new scientific facts had emerged that said, actually, the problem is far worse than we thought. Uh, we have to act sooner or whatever. Nothing like that. It, it was just that these activist groups were suddenly springing up and the government panicked. And we saw the same thing with uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement and the wider wokery movement around them that suddenly you had um, local governments setting up commissions about renaming streets, renaming buildings um, and semi-public and even private organizations, national trusts uh, starting to um, express this woke agenda and, and uh, suddenly talking about the empire again, which wasn't a topic until five minutes before these groups came along. Uh, it's just they suddenly came out of nowhere and totally changed the political agenda. I mean, they must be doing something right. I, I wish we could do 1% of that here. But um, <laughs> so somehow it's, it's strange that it comes and that the government is so panicky about these groups. You've got, you've got these groups, you've got the trade unions again, mm -hmm. just like the, the old end days. Um, and you have, every, when, when they try to ship people off to Rwanda, you have the European Court of Human Rights hoving into view again. Um, is there a sense in which the government's sort of not in, who's driving the bus? And even within the government is, is Rishi Sunak is it or, or is it the Treasury officials I mean are they captive these this, this government well I think one of the problems and this this is maybe me just being an old an old man or something but um, uh, you know they say that you know police don't policemen look so young these days etc etc <laughs> but 
I, I, I look at the parliamentary party and I see a parliamentary party that's the weakest I can remember. And John, it would be unfair to John to comment on this, and I certainly he's accepted from my diagnosis. But I remember when you know, Mrs Thatcher really wouldn't put anyone in the cabinet until they probably held two or three junior ministerial jobs. They knew their way around Whitehall because often you get a civil service that resists mm. your policies. You need to make mistakes and learn from them. Everyone makes mistakes, but do you learn from them? That's the thing. And she was, you know, she was grooming uh, MPs and finding out whether they were up to the big job of being in the cabinet. And you know, part of that, because we have a much more sort of, you know, an activist judicial class, is also being able to, you know, draft legislation that gets past judges and I think we've got to a stage where we just people become important ministers too quickly and they're not in charge of them and then we exit them you know David Cameron uh, Gordon Brown um, Theresa May would all be better now if they were in you know an office now and I just wonder whether we, the, 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 the conveyor belt of getting people into it happens too quickly because actually being a minister is really hard mm -hmm. and John, I think until there. we you're have a lot more there. patience and that's a big not comment there. on our culture mm -hmm. and not easy to solve we will continue to have these problems. And what about the civil service? One got the impression when, uh, during all the Brexit stuff that actually they were uh, that was a terrible terrible uh, a block because obviously we have a very very Remainer civil service. Mm. Um, do you think that the lack of experience in government means that you know the, the, the civil servants Precisely. are just yeah. too powerful? I mean, the, the comments I made earlier about inflation—they sound like they come out of the mouths of a civil servant. There isn't enough money for a tax cut. That sounds like a Treasury civil servant talking. Mm. I mean, I, I guess I guess my, my instinct is that you know, good governments own the agenda they they fill the space they don't allow you know nearly as much oxygen because there isn't as much going round uh, to all these other groups that we were just hearing about because they are setting the agenda they're se they're, they're setting a strong lead and the the point i think is that you know, we've got an 80 seat majority as you were rightly saying uh, saying earlier on um, if we can get ministers and we, we there are there are some there's some really talented ministers in there too i hasten to add there's plenty of talented people who aren't ministers as well but the point about it is that they've got to be able to grip the civil service and and exert that leadership and show the agenda. And when when the when the blob comes back and says, "Oh, ooh, it's all a bit difficult," they're the ones who need to drive through that and say, "No, hang on a get, hang on a sec. Here's how we're going to solve that, and and I'm not going to take no for an answer." But it does take you know, very strong, very experienced ministers to be able to do that. It ain't easy. You're absolutely right. Being a minister is a hard job. And it needs a little bit of civil service reform. I remember when Ian Duncan Smith was you know, introducing universal credit. You know, he, <laughs> in the early stages, it was a, a reform that's paid its dividends over, you know, had its problems, but it's now working. But you know, he sat around the table, civil servants would say, yes, minister, uh, that's on track. And in six months' time, it, you know, that particular issue will be dealt with. Six months later, that civil servant was reshuffled. They weren't there in the department True. to be accountable yeah. for what they said. And you need to have a sort of a project mentality you would have in the private sector where people are held accountable for yeah. saying they're going to deliver. But the trouble is if they're reshuffled every five minutes, yeah. they can't be. We well, need, and you have to we believe need. in it. And Ian Duncan Smith did because he yeah. was yeah. writing about this while he was still a think tanker. Maybe you need more think tankers. Yeah. Um, we, need, and and we also need far more John Penrose's. John, thank you very much for joining us. You've been a, a total star and I hope you'll come back again when there's someone uh, more competent than me in the chair. <laughs> so, as um, uh, having Mr. Penrose on, of course, makes us uh, remind, he's so clever, it makes us remind, um, reminds us that in order to get ourselves out of the mess, we need to think. We need to think. That's what we need to do, which reminds me of the forthcoming IEA conference. Q promo. I'm Steve Davies. Head of Education at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. I'm here to tell you about this year's THINK conference at the Royal Geographical Society in Kensington on the 25th of June. THINK is a conference that the IEA puts on every year with speakers, panels, debates and opportunities for socialising and networking. The focus of THINK is on new ideas and developments and arguments that challenge the dominant perspectives. This year will be the seventh time it has been held and the first face to face one since 2019. Over the years, Think has become a well known and popular event, 
as those who have been before will tell you. You can get tickets for THINK in advance online at thinkiea.com. Tickets cost £15, but the first 50 people who enter the code HAYEK at checkout will get one for free. If you're too late for that, but you enter the code THINK2022, you will get your ticket for £5. You can still buy tickets for full price on the day. We have a great lineup of speakers this year, including the well-known economist Ambisa Moyo, Dame Helena Morrissey, the former Northern Ireland First Minister Arlene Foster, and author and broadcaster Johan Nilberg. The Think Conference is a great way to spend a day in London, to meet lots of new people, and to be exposed to challenging and novel ideas. I look forward to seeing you in Kensington at the Royal Geographical Society on the 25th of June. Welcome back, and I'm pleased to say that we're now joined by the wonderful Danny Boxall from the Taxpayers Alliance. Hello. Cheers, Danny. Hello. I told everyone that we had a woman coming, and you are a woman. <laughs> I think wow. you are a woman. Please don't shoot my gender. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hopefully I'm, I'm so confused these days. I'm so confused. So, who runs Britain? We've now got the threat, I understand the threat of a general strike some people are, people are making. Are the unions back? Are the unions running Britain? What do you think, Danny? Yeah, well, it does feel like we're going back to the 1970s, doesn't it? We've got this massive movement of strikes coming. We've got inflation, you know, hitting about 10%. Um, we've got, you know, beer prices, fuel prices going through the roof. So it does feel like we're sort of going back in time a bit, doesn't it? So uh, maybe, you know, there's, uh, we've got an ABBA reunion even. So it's, uh, it, do, it does definitely <laughs> feel like we're, uh, we're sort of going back in time. And is the Keir Starmer made a point, uh, uh, Prime Minister's question at the time, that Boris Johnson might just like the unions coming back and having a right old strike because then people will think, oh, Labour are connected with the unions who hate unions, they're very disruptive. So actually the Tories might just like a little bit of strike, but just a bit of sympathy for the devil here. How much has inflation actually encouraged, you know, the re-emergence of the unions? I mean, fair dues, when you print that much money, prices go up, real wages go down. So people have genuinely suffered a fall in re real wages at the hands of government action. Aren't they right to get angry? I mean, maybe, you know, the unions aren't necessarily representing the people who are suffering most, but nevertheless, mm. can, we, can we, you know, is that why they're coming back? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, what the RMT is suggesting is that they want us to see an 11% pay increase, which would be technically above inflation, so that they would be protected from the effects of inflation. So that could be one reason why they're, they're coming back. But I think it's kind of ridiculous, given that, you know, how much money we've pumped into the rail network over the last few years because of COVID, when there's been no passengers. Uh, so we've supported them and helped them keep their jobs. And now they're, they're just going to sort of walk away and say, oh, no, we want more money. So it's, it's kind of... Uh, I think, I think it's a very poor effort from the unions to actually go out and do this when, you know, we're just coming back to work. We want people to be going into the office and they're saying, actually, no, thank you. Uh, we, we think this is going to be too much for us. So we're going to put our, put our tools down and walk away. I mean, I mean uh, uh, poor, poor from the unions, maybe, but guys, sympathy for the unions. I mean, they're just to bring in a bit of political economy here, Christian. I mean, capitalism in the heyday, before they started debasing currency so much, the tendency was for prices to go down as we made more things more efficiently and better and all this sort of thing, mm -hmm. and for real wages to go up, for wages to go up. And so you had the standard of living going up, the cost of living going down, that was the kind of natural course of things when capitalism is doing its thing. Then Keynesianism comes along, the big state, they print a lot of money, inflation, and that flips it on its head. Inflation makes things more expensive and it reduces real, real wages. I mean, this government has been reducing real people's wages. It has been pumping up the cost of things. It has created this cost of living crisis. I don't care what anyone says. Printing money creates this. Um, do a little bit of sympathy for the unions? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think we shouldn't condemn individual actors. They are looking after their members' interests and um, you can't blame them for doing it. That is what they were set up to do. Um, the question is just why do we have an industry structure in which they are so powerful? That is where uh, political structures come in. Um, we don't get this in other sectors where you, even where you have higher unionization rates, yes, maybe they can demand um, 
sometimes higher wage increases than a non-unionized uh, sector, but all within limits, uh, within reason, and uh, there, there is a reason why it is always certain sectors like transport that stand out in this respect. But yeah, you're also right that uh, a lot of this is um, cost push inflation. I mean, that was, I think, the historic pattern. That's what um, what happened in the 70s, that, that you had these uh, inflation spirals of uh, costs leading to higher wage demands, leading to higher costs, and uh, that, uh, that, that pattern perpetu perpetuating itself. And it is true that before the, the advent of um, government meddling with the money supply, it wasn't like that. You had under the gold standard 100 years of, uh, of uh, either stable prices, or at least in the aggregate, or even slightly falling prices over time. Yeah. Getting back to the, um, uh, my base question of who runs Britain, obviously we've been raising as a kind of bogeyman the idea that it's not the government in charge and it's all these other groups, it's the European Court of Human Rights, it's the trade unions, it's the civil servants, but what if, God forbid, it's actually the politicians? I mean, you know, <laughs> what if it, they are, and I'll give you for an example, uh, uh, Switzerland. In Switzerland, they're very sensible. If they want to raise taxes in Switzerland, they have a referendum. And they say to the people, do you want to pay more taxes? And they say, usually, no. And then the politicians don't have that much to spend because ordinary people have decided they don't want to uh, have higher taxes. Is there a sense in which we have a problem that the politicians are in charge and the people aren't? If we ask pe ordinary people whether they want to have a tax rate, uh, you know, uh, a tax burden as high, uh, as high as it's been since the Second World War. My guess is they'd say no. No one asked ordinary people if they fancied net zero. No one has asked ordinary people whether they believe all this claptrap about climate change. Would you but have a referendum on net zero yourself? Well, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd have a referendum on net, net zero. I'd have a referendum on pretty much everything as, as, as often as possible. Um, uh, um, and I'd love to argue the case. But as it happens, you know, net zero, it's a green agenda. Boris Johnson's wife's green, his friend Zach Goldsmith, he's an old Etonian, we know, and I know from experience how green those are, the toffs are really green. So he, his friends are green, his family's green, so we've got a green policy. The people aren't necessarily green. Okay, but on taxation, you would lose a referendum. And this question comes up uh, every time and or, or regularly in the British Social Attitude Survey where they ask, uh, do you think public spending and, and taxes should be higher, lower, or about the same as now. And there's always just under half that say higher, just under half that say same as now. There's hardly anyone in the country who do wants do lower do taxes do and do spending. The problem is that that's a general statement. If you ask a person, are your taxes too yeah. high, they're always going to say, yes, they are too high. So saying a general statement like, oh, taxes in general, people don't really connect with that. What they connect with is the tax bill that they see every day when it is in their income, when it's on their pay slip. And they are always, 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 whenever we do polling, it always they always believe that their taxes are too high. Uh, the, the, big, the biggest and one of the most consequential electoral bets was in the uh, 1992 general election. All the polling said what Christian has just testified to is that people were ready then for higher taxes. Ken, uh, then at the time, John Major was Prime Minister, Ken Clark, Michael Hazeltine, the they all said, this, Norman Lamont was the Chancellor, and he said, I don't believe the polling. People want to be virtuous signalling, they want to say they support taxes, but if we run a campaign against this, do you remember the tax bombshell campaign? You pay £1,000 more. Younger viewers to this might not remember, but the Tories had this very dark advert where people were painting onto a sort of a bomb, you pay £1,000 more tax under Labour. And they, they tested it in focus groups. And when voters thought that that was the consequences of Labour, despite what they told opinion polls, they hated it. And actually, I think we still can win on tax if we are, if we are very clear and sharp in our messages. But of course, the Conservative Party has completely undermined its authority to make that campaign at the moment because it's, it's put up so many taxes. So they're managing to sell this line that more and by the way, of course, the story for those young viewers, we won the 1992 general election on that tax bombshell message. Sorry. It was a huge majority, I remember. No, it wasn't. Oh, it but, was it, but it was an unexpected win. Unexpected. All of the polls said Labour would win. OK. And they won from behind on that tax message. Just yeah. a quick point on this. Uh, it is, of course, true that in polls you get virtue signalling because yeah. of social desirability bias. People yeah. say what they think they're socially expected to say. Yeah. Um, but when you have 95% saying uh, taxes, at least what they are now, or even higher, 
that can't just be polling bias. That it's not 95%, maybe. no, we're near 95%. It is? Really? Yeah. We can have That's to talk about this online <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> so they're convincing people that we can't afford to cut taxes. They're convincing people that our taxes are going to this really fun, all the causes are amazingly good. We need a state that is now, I think by the last reckoning, uh, bigger than the, than the private sector in the last fiscal year. So uh, uh, what is the, um, is this the BBC? Is it, I mean, what is, is, we just seem to have a kind of uh, uh, ideological fug that seems to have settled on the entire population that they believe the idea that a massive state is good for us. Is that right? Yes. Uh, but going back to your Switzerland example... I don't believe example, this, true. I don't believe this, Christian. But go going back to your no, no. Switzerland example, even in Switzerland you don't have to have a referendum for every tax increase. But wh what might matter even more that is that if it happens, it would mostly be on the local or regional level. And there, of course, you have the risk that uh, people might move away because moving from one canton to another is not that big an ask. Uh, whereas international tax, tax competition can't really be a substitute for that um, because moving to a different country is, of course, harder than moving 30 kilometers to, um, into to a different locality. And if we had a tax structure like that where taxation was more local or regional, then uh, that would be a very different story regardless of uh, attitudes to taxation in general. I think what the Conservative Party needs to do, and I think this is tricky, and it may not be something that the IEA is completely happy about that I'm about to recommend, but I think what the Conservative well, the Taxpayers Alliance, <laughs> Danny, for that matter, but I think the problem is at the moment, when we talk about tax, we largely think about national insurance and income tax, etc., etc. And I think a lot of better off people are happy to pay those taxes. And, but a lot of poorer people you know, can't afford to pay those taxes, but those aren't... If we, the Conservative Party really started to think about who its new voters are, the biggest change in politics at the moment is that lower income, poorer people are moving to the right, richer, better air, uh, you know, more upscale are moving to the left. But the Conservative Party, the defining tax change that it makes in this parliament during a period when it's just one red wall voters is to put tax up on the new voters that are voting for it, lower income people via its national insurance. If actually, if it was going to change the tax system, it said, we're going to keep taxes on working people down, but we're going to start taxing properly some of these um, increases in assets, the value of assets that better off people do, I think we could begin to transform the tax debate, a reshaping of the tax debate. It's the failure, I think, of the Conservative Party to engage in that that means that it's not winning the tax battle. Is it also, um, uh, Danny, I mean, I mean, Taxpayers Alliance obviously is doing sterling, mm. sterling work in this, is it down to us to actually explain what tax does? I mean, it's, it's, it's not as if Boris Johnson doesn't know what tax does. When he wants to stop us using carbon, he will tax petrol. When he wants to stop obese people from being obese, he taxes sugar. When he stops, wants to stop cancer, he taxes tobacco. He knows that if you tax something, it kills it or it slows it down or it disinhibits it. And when he wants a British you know, film industry, my, my industry, he knows the tax breaks will do. Less tax turns the tap on, more tax turns the tap off. And a tax on the economy, obviously, is turning it off. And we've got, uh, or, you know, the, 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 the analogy of someone with a backpack. If you've got, you know, a tax burden, it's harder to run along the street. And right now we've got a backpack so effing huge, you know, we're staggering along the road. I mean, I mean have, have we got to do a sa better sales job mm. when it comes to saying what tax is, what tax does? Yeah, well, in the case of sugar, I don't think that na necessarily works. And I think the IEA has done some good work on showing how the sugar tax doesn't actually make a difference to obesity. Um, but besides that point, there are a few things that were mentioned earlier that I'd like to come back to, actually, on this issue. Um, I know that John was saying that, you know, we can't give tax cuts that will increase consumption because that doesn't encourage growth. But we've actually done a lot of uh, work on this and showing how tax cuts across the board encourage growth. And we did a package last week showing that if you cut VAT, if you cut income tax to um, by two pence, if you uh, don't go ahead with the national insurance rise, but you keep that raised threshold, which we all, I think we all agree is a very, very good measure. Um, the one thing that the Conservative government has done that is good. Uh, and if you, if you, if you, 
do a package of all of those things actually increases growth by 56 billion pounds by 2029. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that you know certain taxes are better at encouraging growth, and so obviously there are some that are better than others. But I do think tax cuts across the board is what we need right now when we're really struggling with growth. I mean, we all saw the OECD's figures last week that said we're going to be the worst. Uh, of all the wealthy countries for growth in the next year. So I think any tax cut right now is what we really need. Which brings me to, because the answer, when, when you ask John Penrose, wonderful John Penrose or anyone else about um, uh, um, uh, uh, cutting taxes, that thing that was reported of an ally of Boris Johnson saying, we haven't got the money to cut taxes, that perverse uh, <laughs> uh, logic and that thing to say, but that's always the response. We can't cut taxes because that would mean cutting spending. And that seems to be the thing you're simply never, ever allowed to do. Which brings me on to the final uh, uh, topic of this year, which is my favourite, which is how, what do we cut? How do we cut spending? Oftentimes, and this is a, a, a confession of mine, I'll be in the shower. I don't know why it happens to me in the shower. And I fantasise that I'm put in charge of cutting spending in government. Wow. And I have such a good time. I cut <laughs> and I cut and I cut and I cut. People can't believe how much I you cut. You know this is live cut. that people are watching. Yeah. This. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's how sad I am on the shower. But um, I mean, you're, you're, you know, you, you've been involved in welfare and all that kind yeah. of thing, but what do we cut? I'm going to start by asking Christian and suggesting NHS. Well, I wouldn't necessarily cut it, I would just have a very different system. I realise that that isn't going to happen in my lifetime, but just saying in principle, uh, this is a large chunk of government spending that you could just take out of the public sector entirely, um, convert that into a market-based system that doesn't, uh, that, that can still be a system with, uh, with, with uh, government support. Um, but if you had a, a at least semi-privatized system, that would mean a huge chunk of public spending that would be taken out of the control of politicians altogether. And then that would just be another industry like any other. Okay, we're going to come back to the NHS. Welfare, what can be done on, on, on welfare, Tim? I mean, you've worked with uh, IDS on this and uh, uh, we know the poisonous, I know the poisonous effects of welfare. I come from the Northeast and I've got schoolmates of mine who have been unemployed pretty much their whole lives. Um, uh, what can be done there? It's a huge bill. The biggest bill, I think, um, that is we've done least on in welfare is the cost of basically subsidising housing and housing benefits and um, um, the back to my earlier theme which is my biggest theme at the moment is if you can't use a majority of 80 to begin to tackle the housing crisis which I don't know whether we is probably the biggest I'm obsessed with housing and you know, I'm Definitely. really fortunate to own my own home in in Salisbury you know what it gives me in terms of security um, sense of rootedness, uh, community, uh, uh, the ability to borrow in difficult times, it's huge. And it's affordable, you know, for me. And I'm fortunate to be on a reasonable wage, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, There's so many millions of people now in this country, particularly young people, don't have that opportunity. There's so many people who can't even afford to rent. Uh, they're subsidised their rent. It's massive. If we don't build enough houses to sort of give those people the things that I as a homeowner enjoy, we're in big trouble as a, as a nation. And it's a really crude thing that I'm about to say, but it's true, If just to appeal to the Conservative Party. If you increase the number of people who are dependent on welfare, you basically increase the number of Labour voters. If you want to increase the number of Tory voters, you increase home ownership, you increase people who have that sort of stake in the community. And that's what the Conservative Party, more than anything, needs to do. It wants to get public spending under control, it wants to create a people who have a sense of that capitalism, a system based on ownership isn't against them. You've got to start increasing home ownership. And so that would be, if you want to know, you know what's it Blair said, education, education, education. My would be, not housing, 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 because we don't want more measures to increase inflate demand. It would be house building, house building, house building. Beautiful houses, supported by infrastructure, otherwise it becomes unsustainable. But house building, house building, house building. But we're asking the Tories to solve this problem, and they're the people who created the problem in the first place, or certainly they were in the mix of the people who created the problem. Planning restrictions that stop the construction of housing and flats um, anywhere near London. I mean, I'm in Hackney, 
Um, I can, if I'm on my way to the airport to go to one of the many holidays I go on, I uh, <laughs> go, go on to Stan Stansted Airport, within 10 minutes, quarter of an hour of driving from my front door, I'm passing fields growing cabbages and carrots yeah. and all this sort of stuff. What the hell is that going on? I mean, you know, a lot why? of the green belt isn't that green. Of course, there's a green belt, and also, yeah. you know, they, they say we're going to must protect the countryside. Those those fields I'm passing are huge, flat, rectangular things. People imagine sort of postman Pat when they think about the countryside. This is nothing to do with postman Pat. They're very large, flat, boring fields. If you went into the middle to try and have a picnic, they'd set the dogs on you. These are not pretty, lovely recreational mm. places. But it's the policies of the Tories that has, um, uh, uh, not least, that that has done this. Yeah. Um, and, and yet they do nothing. And also, a uh, uh, gripe I've got about housing, when they talk about um, uh, the need for housing, they say the government must do, uh, must, you know, uh, uh, build more houses. The government must build more houses? It's like saying we haven't got enough laptops. The government must build more laptops. You know, why is the government building houses? The government crap at doing everything. I mean, the Tories don't seem to understand housing. They don't seem to understand the NHS. Danny, what's to be done? What can we cut? What's to be done? Uh, well, I'd like to go back to talking about civil service. I know we were talking about earlier. Civil service, we can throw that back in. Who runs Britain? You know, well, civil yeah. service, obviously, a, sort of a big problem at the moment. And I think we've all seen the um, our home office tweets recently from the Rwanda um, uh, about the Rwanda de deportations and how they're sort of trying to put a halt to that within the the Home Office itself. So um, I think what the government is doing in terms of reducing the numbers back to 2016 levels are great. Um, I think that, you know, that's a long... Proposing to do. Proposing to do, yeah, mm. exactly. Whether they'll do it. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's definitely one thing that mm. uh, we need to be worried about. Um, and also, you know, the other things that they've been talking about, getting rid of um, diversity managers in the NHS, that kind of... You know, all this sort of bloated public sector, un un unneeded jobs, you know, non-jobs that we talk about all the time. Um, getting rid of those um, would be a great place to start. Uh, and then, obviously, there's a lot more they could do. And just, like, simple reforms, uh, like bringing the amount of leave that a civil servant can take in the year in line with the private sector to 25 days. That would save £3 billion pounds a year. It's a lot of money. And... You know, these are just simple things that the government could be doing that they're not doing. To, so lots to save of those money. things. Christian, you were nodding during housing. You're like, very enthusiastic about housing. Yes, well. yes, so that's a double thing. You, you pay less in housing benefits, and at the same time, the cost of living comes down because the price of houses would, of course, come down if you built more. Is that right? Yes, this is uh, as close as we can get to a silver bullet. Um, if we build sufficient levels of houses, um, you would get large parts of, uh, of, of public spending would also become unnecessary. Uh, it's firstly the housing benefit bill itself, which is, I think, something like 30 billion pounds. Um, used to be a third or so of that uh, 30 years ago, so it could absolutely go back to that level just by building enough housing and you wouldn't even have to specifically cut it because it is already pegged to rent levels so if rents fall housing benefit automatically falls with it and you would need less spending on, on social housing and other related things um, so that can all be done and what's most frustrating about this is that this is an area where the government was initially on the right track um, their planning bill that they had about two years ago uh, the idea was basically take some of the politics out of it because at the moment every planning application is a political football every time a planning application uh, comes in um, you have neighborhood groups discussing about it and of course this is these are self-selected groups only NIMBYs uh, choose to take part in that where the idea was to set some general rules where you say in this area you can build this in that area you can build that and when and then there's no further discussion. So if uh, if you comply with those local rules, which can have a design code and, and all that, um, then planning permission cannot be unreasonably refused. That was the idea. What then happened is was that some backbenchers rebelled against it and they lost one by election. Uh, but okay, if you have an 80 seat majority, I would have said, <laughs> you know what, we get that down to a majority of one if necessary, but we'll push this yeah. through. But this is a silver bullet. You describe it as a silver bullet. One policy that could make a huge, huge, huge difference to all of the problems that we're, that, 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 that we're talking about. Well, normally when I come, I'm normally invited by the IEA to be the sort of the wishy-washy, lefty, <laughs> compassionate, conservative, whatever you want to call it, on the panel. And normally Christian and I are in violent disagreement on most things. When Christian and I agree, which I think we are on mm, this that, issue, that tells there's, you something. Of, there's an opening in the universe, yeah. isn't there, for a different future. 
Well, that's I'm quite excited about this. Yeah. Whole <laughs> but just, uh, just a question down, is whether is the Christian or I are leader of the party that we formed together with deputy or leader. What do you think? Uh, we'll draw lots. We'll draw lots. Okay. Yeah. And, but on, on a, on a, on a, on a Sarah note, the NHS. I mean, is there a sense in which the prevailing view though, is, you know, uh, uh, the, the public sector, the left, and in fact the One Nation Tories, um, um, uh, will want will not touch the NHS, will not touch anything like that. In fact, with education as well. What's more important, it seems, is that something is state-run rather than it's good. Hmm. It's more important that the NHS stays in safe hands than it's any good. It's more important that schools stay in safe hands uh, than states' hands than, than they're any good. Catherine Burblesen getting a right old kicking. Why? She's actually got yeah. a really successful school that's turning around the lives of a lot of poor kids. Yeah. And she's getting the most terrible kicking. It, are we just in this poisonous atmosphere where the blob is determined to keep things in state hands and is, is, is re will refuse a Tory government even that's trying to go in the right direction. I think that's a, I think the, the power of the bureauc bureaucracy is definitely underestimated and um, it, it, it all recycles, you know, you can see it in the charitable sector as well, which is supposedly the third sector, it's supposed to be an alternative sector, but you know, I, from my experience when I was sort of working in, this, in, in the theme of voluntary sector policy in the past, you just see this constant recycling of staff between local government, charities and central government. And they all think the same. And the problem is, is once government starts funding the charitable sector in, you know, in a large scale, the charitable sector starts dancing to the government's tune. It's a bear hug where the life of it is really squeezed out. And um, I'm afraid the blob to use that expression, is very powerful. And we need a much more serious strategy, strategy about how we reform the civil service. And we, we don't have that at the moment. Guys, you are you know, so good at cutting to state spending. In fact, next time I'm in the shower, I'm going to be thinking of you three. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have a much more exciting time there. Thank you ever so much. It's airing before the watershed, this, uh, this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my beautiful guests. Um, uh, thank you, everyone at home. Um, we're back in a fortnight f with another fascinating show with our next um, a guest host, Alex Dean, who hopefully will be a damn sight better than me. Um, please, please like and subscribe to this, uh, uh, this, this naughty channel. Um, and, and finally, a Patreon plus. And I remember not knowing what Patreon was last time, but it's how you can give money to the IEA, much needed money to this much needed organization which does such good uh, work. Huge thanks uh, to you who support, to the top tier IEA online patrons, uh, Donald Blaney, James Burns, Jordan Grover, um, Mark Edwards, Philip Ozof, um, Richard Leader, uh, Robert Appleby and Timothy Worrell. Um, if you'd like to find out more about our patron, uh, patron account, Patreon account, Emily. Patreon, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Patreon. <laughs> Please go to <laughs> patreon.com forward slash IEA London or email lwl at iea.org.uk. Thank you so much. We love you all. Mwah. <laughs>